As a candidate, Donald Trump has had a wide berth to talk a lot without saying much. This morning, Time magazine published a new interview with Trump where they asked him serious, probative questions about what a second Trump presidency would actually look like. And it's dark stuff. From a dictatorship only on day one, migrant detention camps using the Comstock Act to ban abortion, and policing protesters by deploying the National Guard. He told Times reporter that he'd be willing to fire a U.S. attorney who didn't prosecute someone he ordered, noting that it depends on the situation. He explained that obliterating the so-called deep state meant getting rid of bad people, people that have not done a good job for him. He would absolutely pardon criminals convicted of assaulting the Capitol on January 6th, telling time that many of those people went in, many of those people were ushered in. You see it on tape. The police are ushering them in. They're walking with the police. When the reporter asked Trump what he thought of Americans who found his language about being a dictator for a day or suspending the Constitution, contrary to American democracy, he said, I think a lot of people like it. And much like the last election, when asked if he was worried about violence, Trump acknowledged that it would only happen if he loses, which sounds an awful lot like a threat. Joining me now is Robert Kagan, Washington Post editor-at-large, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of Rebellion, how anti-liberalism is tearing America apart again, which was published today. A timely book. We're going to talk about it shortly, but I want to talk about this time interview. If I had one criticism of it, um, Robert, it was the way that they placed Donald Trump's plans, including letting states monitor women's abortions, monitor women's, I guess, menstrual cycles. I don't know how they would do that. And they placed it against, well, here are all the legislative barriers to that as if there would be legislative barriers, as if there would be some sort of normal functioning democracy with him as president. What did you make of the interview and the revelations therein? Well, I'm sorry, I have to admit, I haven't, I haven't read the interview, although I've seen uh, the, the, the quotes that came out of it and what you just read. And, and I think there is a general tendency, uh, unfortunately, in this country to just assume that because our system has been functioning, because the institutions have been operating for many years, that, that they will save us ultimately. Uh, but I think that the founders of the republic could have told us that it isn't the institutions by themselves. The people uh, have to act correctly. The people have to understand uh, what threat uh, exists right now from uh, Donald Trump in terms of becoming a dictator. Uh, you really, you know, they spoke of the need for virtue and by which they meant the people rising up to protect our system against the dictator. I don't mean rising up illegally. I mean rising up electorally, uh, uh, forcing congressmen to do the right thing, et cetera. So I think we can be very passive sometimes and just hope that the institutions will save us. But I think that's a mistake. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I'm just going to put up a... a, a Unlimited, sort of a limited list of the things that Trump has said he would do in 2025. Mass layoffs of civil servants and replacing them with loyalists. Terminating the Constitution. Politicizing the DOJ to investigate his political adversaries. Bomb Mexico. Shoot migrants. Electrify the wall. Uh, no two-state solution in the Middle East. End birthright citizenship. Revoke student visas for ceasefire protesters. Um, re re reinstate and expand the Muslim ban, gut the EPA, exit the Paris Climate Accords, a national ban on trans care for minors, punishing hospitals that provide any transgender care, teaching what he calls patriotic education, terminate the Department of Education. I could go on. Allowing states to punish women as they see fit, uh, enforce the Comstock Act to buy an abortion nationwide. I, I mean, everything he has in here, shoot shoplifters. Shoot shoplifters, federal takeovers of Democratic cities. And people hear that, see that, read that and say, I want that. What should we make of that? Well, he was right at the end. of I guess it was I don't know it was the end of that interview, but I but it was the end of your quotations when when he was asked, you know, what, what does he think about, you know, violating the Constitution, et cetera, and calling yourself dictator of a day. And he said the people like it. And I think that's a very important point that we are not focusing enough on. This isn't just about Donald Trump. He does have a very powerful, uh, very mobilized constituency that is fundamentally seeking to overthrow the fundamental uh, liberal system that the founders created. They, they oppose it. They oppose it because they think that 
Uh, their view of the nation, they have an ethno-religious definition of the nation. For them, the nation is a white Christian. For some of them, it's a white Protestant nation. This is an old uh, uh, strain in, in American history, after all. This didn't just pop up. It's just what's happened now is that these people who've always been around, they were part of the John Birch Society, they were part of the McCarthy movement, they were in the South during the slave years, they were in the South during the Jim Crow years, but now, for the first time, certainly in, in many decades, they've taken control of one of the political parties, and they have a, a leader uh, who is essentially determined to destroy the system for his own purposes, but what they see is the opportunity to change the system in a way that is more to their liking and therefore not consistent with what the founders intended. Well, and, and they've corrupted, you know, this sort of ethos has corrupted the Supreme Court, right? I mean, I detect a, a, a desire to institute a kind of religious diktat uh, over the country from people like Samuel Alito. And, and you know, I've talked about it repealing the 20th century as being a core goal of MAGAism. It feels like what offends them is that the 20th century made, and you talk about this in your book, what the Constitution sort of prescribed as a kind of small L liberalism, right, where there's individual liberty, the 20th century is the great American century because it actually made that more real for women, for workers, for, you know, what used to be child laborers, for people of color, for immigrants, um, for black people. And they are offended by it, by the whole 20th century. That's right. And it's important to separate that from what they talk about. They're upset about wokeness. But, you know, right. the, people were upset about wokeness back in the civil rights era, too. Yeah. There were many whites who were upset about the civil rights movement, and they regarded it as the wokeness of their time. So it's really true that it is the fundamental elements of our system that they're opposed to, even though they want to say that it's that's an excess of wokeness. And I And I just think we need to understand that... It isn't just the whims of Donald Trump. And, and, you know, one of the reasons that he's talking the way he talks is that his most reliable group of supporters are what I, I think you can't have a better word for them than white nationalists. Um, he ran in his first campaign, people don't remember, I think, back in 2011 when he was his first run for the presidency, he ran on a one issue, which was birtherism, which was yeah. basically to say that the first American, black American president was not really an American. And yeah. in so doing, he signaled to those people that he was their representative. And they have basically chosen him uh, as their leader. And he, they are essential to him because as he goes through these court trials, as he faces the various uh, pressures that he faces in the system, he can't rely on your average, you know, Mitt Romney yeah. voting Republican. He has to rely on these hardcore white nationalists, in some cases white Christian nationalists, who are sticking with him no matter what, no matter what yeah. happens in the trials. And th this is the book. Uh, we're going to talk more about it on the other side of the break, because I want to get into some of your thesis, which is really about these people saying that they are the super patriots, but how they fundamentally disagree with the founders on what the system is. You talk about that in this book. We're going to do that on the other side of the break. Uh we begin tonight with week two of testimony in Donald Trump's hush money election interference trial. For the first time, one of Trump's family members, middle son Eric, joined him in the courtroom along with some of Trump's associates. It also appears that Trump's repeated pleas for his supporters to please come to his aid worked, with a few dozen appearing outside the court. It is unknown if any of those supposed supporters also carry a SAG card. But those may be the only highlights to Trump's day, given what transpired inside the courtroom. Most of the day was spent hearing from Keith Davidson, the former attorney for both Karen McDougal and Stormy Daniels. Davidson is a key player in the scheme and alleged conspiracy to pay off the two women to keep their stories about their alleged sexual encounters with Trump from going public before the 2016 election. The prosecution did not just rely on Davidson's testimony, but also his text messages and emails from that time. Text messages between Davidson and the editor of the National Enquirer, David Howard, Dylan Howard, detail the deal made with McDougal, beginning with, I have a blockbuster Trump story. Upon finalizing the agreement, Howard texted Davidson, quote, we are going to lay it on thick for her. Davidson replied, good. Throw in an ambassadorship for me. I'm thinking Isle of Man. Today, Davidson testified that his comment was something of a joke, but he sent it because he knew the deal would help Trump's candidacy. The texts between the two also lay out the impact 
of Stormy Daniels' reemergence in the days following the October 2016 release of the Access Hollywood tape. Davidson texted Howard on October 8th. Trump is effed, with Howard responding, wave the white flag, it's over, people. The next day, Davidson texted, hi, the story is already out there, to which Howard responded, yeah, but her talking and taking blank is the final nail in the coffin, but he's effed already. Davidson testified, testified on how Michael Cohen missed deadlines to make the $130,000 payment to Daniels, with Davidson recalling Cohen saying, what do you expect me to do? My guy's in five effing states today. My guy, of course, referring to Donald Trump. It was then, Davidson claims, that Cohen said he would just pay it himself. And that is how Cohen came to pay out the money by taking out a home equity line of credit. And that also brings us to the other witnesses we heard from this morning who were brought on to authenticate various records. That included continued testimony from one of Cohen's bankers, Gary Farrow, who we started to hear from on Friday. He provided the receipts on how Cohen moved fast and furious less than two weeks before the 2016 election to both set up an account and complete the wire transfer to Stormy Daniels with Keith Davidson for the $130,000 in hush money. And that payment could not have come quickly enough, as Davidson also presented emails stating that 10 days prior to that wire transfer and after much delay, Stormy Daniels was going to cancel the settlement agreement altogether. Now, someone may need to tell Trump about all these developments, given that his eyes were closed for extended periods throughout the day. Again, creating the appearance that has led to folks calling him Sleepy Don. But before Trump started to reach that slumbered state, he was told by Judge Juan Marchand that he was being held in criminal contempt for violating the gag order with his attacks on the jurors and potential witnesses. While he was only fined $1,000 for each of the nine violations, Marshawn warned in the decision that he would not tolerate further violations of the order and said if necessary and appropriate under the circumstances, he would impose an incarceratory punishment on the former president, meaning jail. When the trial resumes on Thursday, it will begin with another hearing over additional alleged gag order violations by Trump. Joining me now is Paul Butler, former federal prosecutor, Georgetown law professor, and MSNBC legal analyst, and Tony Schwartz, CEO of The Energy Project and co-author of Donald Trump's The Art of the Deal. Thank you both for being here. I'm going to start here at the table with you. Um, let's start with the gag order, Paul. Um, fines for now, jail later, Donald, if he keeps violating it. Donald Trump did take down the offending posts. But is $9,000 a real penalty? Um, no, not for Donald Trump. It's chump change. He has the biggest megaphone of any criminal defendant in U.S. history, and he uses it to disparage witnesses in violation of the gag order. Maybe it makes political sense. He's got sure. to give his followers some reason to believe that these folks like Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, who could send him to jail or at least uh, cause him to become a convicted criminal, he's got to give his followers a reason not to believe them, but that's in direct contradiction to what the judge has ordered. Joy, any other defendant who willfully disobeyed nine times, yeah. nine contempt sanctions yeah. would be sitting under Rikers Island right now. So Donald Trump doesn't think of it this way, but this is yet another example of him being treated differently because yeah. he's Donald Trump. Absolutely. What did you think was the most substantive development today? Keith Davidson testifying. He was, of course, the lawyer who arranged the payments. And also you had the banker finishing his testimony about how quickly Michael Cohen acted to create that LLC to sort of make this sort of pretense of a company to send that money uh, to Stormy Daniels. So as we have to remind everyone, paying hush money isn't a crime. Right. What Donald Trump is charged with is falsifying business records that disguise these hus money payments. He did that 34 times, according to Alvin Brack. That's a misdemeanor, but gets bumped up to a felony mm -hmm. if the purpose of these false business records was to try to commit another crime. Alvin Bragg says those other crimes were state and federal campaign violations and also New York tax laws. What does that mean? It means that Alvin Bragg has to prove that this was all about the campaign. And that's what this witness helped do today. So Mr. Davidson was the lawyer for both Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. He testified that all of this was about the campaign. It wasn't 
contrary to what Trump wants the jurors to think about keeping this information from Melania. It wasn't yeah. about protecting his family. Yeah. He's got text messages and emails to prove it. So ultimately, Michael Cohen's going to come and say the same thing. Yeah. What Bragg is hoping is that Michael Cohen will be the um, kind of most anticlimactic star witness in history <laughs> because everything that Cohen says... Uh, uh, Alvin Bragg wants the jurors to have heard before from other witnesses. And it's already been coordinated uh, with, you know, physical testimony and not just that, but also text messages, et cetera. Uh, Tony, let me bring you in here. Um, what do you make of the fact that Donald Trump did make an adjustment today, seemingly finally having a family member in court with him so that he wouldn't look alone? I remember being in the courtroom. He definitely looked lonely with that empty bench behind him with no family and no one there. And then Secret Service one row back. So he looked really sort of solitary. What do you make of the fact that Eric Trump showed up today? Well, I, I imagine the family drew straws and he lost um, because nobody would want to be there with him. Um, I think it's irrelevant. I think clearly he made that decision the same way he makes every decision, which is how do I want it to look as opposed to what what is it really? Uh, I don't think having him there affected it one way or the other. His eyes are closed. He, is, he appears to be either sleeping or off in some sort of reverie. And um, the notion that this guy is having to sit there for nine hours a day or eight hours a day is such for him a torture that it overshadows everything, Joy, that I think is happening in the trial. This yeah. is a man who is demonstrating very clearly why he's not qualified to be president. And meanwhile, if you try to ask yourself the question, what's been a good moment for Trump in this trial? You probably can't come up with one because virtually everything, including all of the testimony today and the fact that he was found to be in contempt, have to militate against him. So I I think... I think he is putting on a spectacle. Yeah. But, well, well, let me ask you this, because there is reporting that he's unhappy with Todd Blanche, his attorney, who, when I saw him in court, he seemed very uh, fidgety and not confident. He's a former federal prosecutor, actually, he's a, apparently a good prosecutor at the time. Um, but he wants more aggression out of Todd Blanche. He's not happy with the lack of aggression. Well, you can't win as a lawyer for Trump, particularly when you're losing, particularly when Trump recognizes that this isn't going his way. Uh, whether it was this lawyer or any other lawyer, this is a really tough case to litigate. Uh, it's a really difficult argument to make. You've got a client who's almost impossible uh, to keep in his seat. Uh, so I think, you know, assessing his performance is kind of irrelevant. I think the, the issue is that Trump is going to beat up on anybody who's falling short of making him look innocent in a situation in which he is guilty as hell. <laughs> Let me play a little bit. So there, there was an interesting thing that happened, Paul, today. They played some C-SPAN archives. Let me play a little bit of what they showed in court today. It's a phony deal. I have no idea who these women are. I have no idea. I have no idea. And I think you all know I have no idea because you understand me for a lot of years. Okay. When you looked at that horrible woman last night, you said, I don't think so. I don't think so. Whoever she is, wherever she comes from, the stories are total fiction. They're 100% made up. They never happened. They never would happen. They're all horrible lies, all fabrications, and we can't let them change the most important election in our lifetime. Michael Cohen is a very talented lawyer. What do you think was the, why did the prosecution play that? Well, it's Trump's voice in court. This is the first time the jury has actually heard what Donald Trump sounds like and what's he doing. He's lying. So first of all, I don't see how he takes the stand because he's going to be able to be impeached uh, with his lies and with his misconducts. He says he didn't uh, cheat on his wife. And again, that's not a crime. But right. if he's making that assertion to try to prove his innocence or yeah. at least get the jury to find him not guilty, then the jury's not going to um, uh, 
like him very much. Again, if he sticks by that statement, so yeah. then he'll be in that classic position where the prosecutor says, well, are you, were you lying then, then when you said it was a lie, or are you lying now when you said it wasn't a lie? So yeah. part of it, again, is to kind of uh, prevent Trump from taking the stand, although in some ways prosecutors would love that oh, because sure. then all of this other evidence in. comes in. Uh